Hello. A very good morning to all of you. Today we address one of the major concerns of health of the present era. And I would be sharing my own experience with this disease. With this disease. It's it's a complete seven years old journey, which I will try and put it in an hour's time. So I'm going to leave out a lot of nitty gritty of the subject and just give out a brief outline. The whole idea is if it can inspire some of you, I think I've done my job. So we start. Next. Well, uh, for most of you know me here, but for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Munjal Thakar. And I keep shuffling around in these four roles. First, as a physician, I'm a homeopath by uh, profession, and I practice here in Ahmedabad. I also teach. I teach at the Ahmedabad Homeopathic College. Uh, I'm a faculty at a couple of more institutes, which are uh, the IAH, it's called the International Academy of Advanced Homeopathy, the other song, Spandal Holistic Institute. Both these institutes, I have a part here in Ahmedabad, and their headquarters are located in Bombay. I am also an independent researcher, uh, again associated with the two institutes. And the new area of research is my work with diabetes. And lastly, I am also doodling around with being a manager, trying to manage the satellite center of Spandan here. Uh, that's about what I do. Some facts of diabetes. For those, we all know what diabetes is, I, I presume. It's one of the diseases where the metabolism to deal with glucose, deal with uh, carbohydrate fails. And we have a sustained high blood sugar, which can produce a lot of difficulty, a lot of complications. So, worldwide, uh, this is what we see, the dark green areas are the amount of population, number of people suffering from diabetes. In India, we, India and China, 50 million, more than 50 million, well, I don't even know how many zeros would a 50 million have. Uh, in Ahmedabad and in Gujarat, we would practically be having at least 1 in 10, a little more than that, at least 1 in 10. That is the amount of prevalence of diabetes. It is projected over the next, by the time we become 2025, where our economy will be supposedly booming, so would be the number of diabetes also booming. We will practically have 25%, one in four people. So we are at a very, very difficult time. And of course, we are, next can we, we are Gujaratis, so we can't forget. 11% of the total health budget of every country is what diabetes just drains. Most countries don't even have that kind of amount. So you will find a lot of African countries not spending. It's not that that's not required, but they don't have the money. And as an individual also, for those who have diabetes here would know what is the cost. A blood sugar costs you 150 rupees. A mean blood sugar costs you each time 400 rupees. These are bare minimum things. Drugs, huge cost. And like petrol prices, the drug prices also keep jumping. Right? Next. Well, but there is something more encouraging. 80% of diabetes can be prevented by eating healthy and by doing a 30 minutes good, moderately intense exercise. And this is the point that I'm going to harp upon. This is the point where we can take a lot of things. We can, we can make a lot of shift when we talk of these two areas. Next. Well, so now I tell you my story. So almost 2005, I remember roughly, is where I first time got my sugars done. I was weak groggy, drowsy, and I believe those who have experienced diabetes would certainly have experienced this symptom 
at least some time, even if their sugars are well controlled. So this is what was happening to me. Weight gain, muscle weakness, and I was not able to concentrate. My blood sugars were 212. This is, I would say, an early time where I picked up what happened. I was fortunate that my body was throwing these symptoms at 212. Recently, I had a patient who just went on routine examination, post line sugar 536, and he is walking into my clinic. His system didn't realize, or I personally believe that we are so engaged into what we are doing outside that we are completely not in touch with our body to realize what's happening inside. This is what can happen, but I was lucky. So the lesson that I learned is early intervention. The earlier you identify, the earlier you intervene, the better are the chances to prevent, to reverse this disease. Next. So the first thing that happened, that I had to make a change. Change in the food that I love to eat, and I had to do exercises which I hated to do. I was a complete foodie. There was not a single restaurant in South Bombay that I had not eaten in. Every, the whole list of the menu I would have tasted. So I had to make a change. And I believe this is the first thing that the diabetic, once you're diagnosed, you have to do this. And that is the toughest challenge. To start exercising at the age of 35, for the first 35 years in life, I have never jogged, never walked, and I had to do after 35 years. Next. So, what do I do? Well, I could have chosen taking pills and then saying, it's okay, let the pills manage my blood sugar and my diabetes. But I thought for a while that Initially, taking pills and looking at your blood sugar reports is nice. But as time passes, your number of pills goes on increasing, still your blood sugars don't get into control. So I made a choice, a difficult choice, to give up food, which I like the most, and to start moving, start exercising. So why did I make these two very, very difficult choices, and why did I? try to do it, and what was it that prompted me to change? This is, I believe, the most important step. Do we have a reason to change? I don't think till we have a very strong reason to change, we make a change. Yes? How many of you would just start saying, oh, I'm going to give up sugar today, I'm going to give up potatoes today, I'm going to give up pizza and McDonald's without a reason? we certainly wouldn't like to make. Also, the figures that I told you are certainly not going to motivate you tomorrow to go and give up cheeseburgers, right? So I had to go and look into myself and check, do I have a reason to make a change? Next. Yes. There was only two motivating factors. The first was my love for medicine and my desire to excel in the work that I do. Because every morning when I sat with my patients, I would be groggy with blood sugar levels of 200 plus. What he's talking, I'm listening and writing down mechanically. My brain doesn't analyze information that fast. So I decided that if I have to excel, the first obstacle to excellence is going to be my diabetes and my blood sugar. So I better do something about it. And I absolutely love my work. And then, my little daughter. No. <laughs> I'm used to that. <laughs> well, so, she was a driving force with whom I had to interact and I had to match her energy levels. And if I had to do that, I had to make the change. So, Anybody who wishes to make a change will have to look into one's own self as to what is that thing that you are passionate about for which 
you are willing to give up a lot of your comforts. Can we have the next slide, Charlie? Yes. So this is the first step to discover the love beyond yourself for which you are willing to let go all the comforts, all the pleasures. Do we have that cause? Do we have that reason? Fortunately, I could discover it. And I will tell you what is the importance of being driven by this passion. Had you not been driven by this passion, on the way, somewhere in the middle, you are going to say, I am going to give it up. Forget it. The pills are there to take care of me. So anybody who wishes to make the change, I would suggest look into yourself, make that, get in touch with yourself, discover that passion for which you want to make the change. So you can see here, there were many, many forces going against you. The first thing is your love for food. The second thing is going to be convenient food that is available everywhere. And the last thing is going to be your peer pressure. When you are in a group, chalne, su farak pade se. Ek ice cream khai le na. Khare khar su farak pade. That one ice cream is not going to make so much of a difference. But it keeps happening again and again. So these are forces that are going to keep coming again and again to you which you will have to encounter. And you really need something very, very strong and powerful going exactly in the opposite direction. So walking the path. So I would divide the whole this journey into two phases. The first phase is when I got myself diagnosed in 2005 roughly and up to 2010, five years, what I did. And after 2010 till the present day, there have been two very distinct phases, but one merging into the other one, and you'll see the effects on both. Next. So I went on with what traditionally we do with diabetes, give up your sugar and take sugar substitutes. That's what I did. You take sugar free, you take equal, wherever you feel you need a sweet taste. You take a low oil food, no cheese, no butter, no ghee, no fruit juices, we all know about this, right? I took cow's milk, buttermilk, curds. This is what we normally do. Next. So, in this, what were the toughest challenges? Is I had a sweet tooth, which I had to encounter, which I had to beat. My craving for cheese and for junk food, I loved, absolutely loved it. And dealing with the group that you are going to be in. So what do I do to beat these temptations? So, wait, I'll just hold on. I talk a little bit about our craving for cheese and our craving for sugar, especially. Today, what has happened to our senses with the kind of food that we are eating? Can we have a next? Just click once. Yes. This is an urban sky. What do you notice? Nothing. You walk down at night in Ahmedabad or in any of the urban cities and you try counting the stars you'll be able to count them. Mm -hmm. Next. This is what you will actually discover when you go into one of the rural areas. What it would be. How many of you have felt this? How many of you have realized this distinction? Innumerable stars? I never believed it. I could count stars. No, I never could see constellations. I never could see shapes. I said, I don't know how these people would imagine. But when you go out there, you start seeing shapes. What has actually happened is our eyes 
are so much exposed to brilliant light all day, all night, that they have lost the ability to look at the dim, fine and the delicate light of the stars. And this is exactly what is happening to our taste buds. Eating cheese, eating junk food, eating sugars, refined sugars that I am talking about, sugar substitutes, is exactly what it is doing to us. Our taste buds have developed a threshold to experience the sweetness. For those who are eating refined sugar and who love to eat refined sugar, if I tell them that if you eat a plain chapati, plain roti of wheat, it tastes sweet to me, I don't think most of you will even agree to that. Our taste buds have become blind to the fine natural taste. This is the first important information that I began to realize when I had to deal with craving for food. Next. So I had to, what is very important is to reprogram this memory for food. It is this memory of the sweet taste, it is that high of the cheese that is completely ingrained into our brains. So, when the memory starts becoming dim, our system says, I am missing cheese, I haven't had pizza, let's go and have pizza, let me go and have something sweet. And we go back, and what do we do? We relive that memory, right, of that experience. How many of you have felt this need for cheese if you have not had it for 15 days? Need for junk food? Lucky. Those who have not felt it, lucky. But I used to feel it. So I had to reprogram it. You have to create a new memory. Completely wash. Let the old memories get washed. So, what you need to do is firstly, you have to initially for the first two months, I had to actually watch my craving come and go. And it was a difficult time. The first two months are a difficult time when you give up. But after two months, when your system has not taken in that refresher dose, it doesn't ask for more, at least initially. And meantime, I started eating the right kind of food without sugar and without cheese and without all the junk food. So I could create a new program in my head. Now here is the point this point of watching and to let go of your craving. This is the point where that the first step, why do you want to make a change? That will hold you back. If you don't have the cause, you are going to give in to the craving. Now each time I was tempted to eat a cheeseburger, it would come back to me, what is it that I want to do in life? And it would kind of hold me back. So I managed my 60 days through that. Then I started keeping away from temptations and you keep the right food handy. This is extremely difficult, <coughs> keeping the right food handy. Till date, it's a difficult task for me. And I believe it's a difficult task for all of us. When you are out and you feel hungry on the road, what is most easily available? Yes? Ice cream, vada pao, which you just cannot say no to. Yeah? Next. So, by doing the usual traditional diabetes diet, which I maintained fairly strictly, I could achieve something. You can see, these are mean blood sugars. Okay? This mean blood sugar is actually the amount of sugar over the three month period, what we call glycosylated hemoglobin in technical terms. And I kept measuring that. You see, I started at November 2006 was the first report available to me in my records. Prior to that, I don't have the records. I started somewhere from 7.1. It started increasing from 7.1 to 7.3 from November 2006 to February 2008. And this was in spite of 
doing what best I could do. And I had to do something even better than what I was already doing. Well, so you can also see the weight was 85. Now this is no good. Why? My initial weight to start with was 92. And it was 85. 85 is okay. I was still far from my ideal weight. Then the weight again goes up to 86 over a period of 6 months. At 2008, around 2008, I re-looked into my diet, again stuck to the plan and this time what I did was you eat by 8 o'clock at night. Eat every 4 hours by the clock. And I could manage this. Now only a stubborn character like me can manage this. Huh? Only my wife knows what kind of stress she had to undergo when at 8 o'clock I am sitting in the clinic and if I don't get my food, it's done. So we had a very tough time managing our diet. And this is what happens with most of people who at least attempt to get onto the right track. Hmm? And therefore, by this time, you give up. Possible or nothing. When you go out into the group, dinner starts at 10.30. So what to do? Eat. Because you can't say no, no? To, to, to the people and to your tongue also. Well, so I managed somehow, with all the friction, all the, and a lot of cooperation from my wife. It came down to 6.1. Now, this was something nice for me. I said, this is what I have done, 6.1. And mind you, it is 2008, it is 3 years down the line, it's 6.1. This is important to note that if you are diagnosed at a point X, within 5 years time, if you are on the borderline, you will become a frank diabetes. It's a known fact. Come what you may try. So 5 years is a cutoff line. After 5 years, you do what you want to do, your pancreas are exhausted and your sugar level starts climbing up. But I could achieve 6.1. This is good, it was near normal. Again, you can see from September 2008 till August 2009, 6.1, 6.6 and 6.8. In August 2009, I said, I'm finding it too difficult now. So I better take a drug. I went, talked to my diabetologist, he said you need to start a drug at any cost. Well, so I started. What happened? Suddenly? Thank you. So please come here. August 2009 was the time where I started taking my drug. This was my first drug introduced into the system. 2005, 2009. Within four years, you are onto the drug line. And I was done. I was with it. With the drug, mind you, I had not left my diabetes regime of eating, of maintaining the time. And this is what I achieved. 6.5 and 6.6. .6. This is the best that I could do with it with the drug. And now he says, look boss, you need two drugs. And I was shit scared. One drug, within six months, eight months, you need two drugs. And you are not too far from insulin also now. So I said, I better look into something now and do something. I was doing the best I could do with my diet and lifestyle. Anything beyond that would be an impossible, practical impossibility to do it. Next. Then, in 2010 was the next phase that started happening. I, I used to do a lot of research on what's going on with this lifestyle modification. I came across uh, two things. First, I came across a research done by Dr. Neil Bernard. Uh, we, we are going to talk about that. Can we go to the next 
slide. That is nearly two years ago. Next. I found this very, very startling fact. First thing, my own Harrison's textbook of medicine, which is supposed to be the Bible of medicine, they said bovine milk proteins are going to be a causative factor for your diabetes. Bovine milk protein means cow and everything preferred from all the cattle. That protein becomes a causative factor for your diabetes. It was very, very shocking for me. The next thing, nitrosourea compounds. What are nitrosourea compounds? Is urea. Now, urea is normally manufactured by in human urine, and it's an excreted out. But this urea is used as a preservative in milk that we drink. Tons of urea is put into it so that the milk doesn't get spoiled in the transportation. So we are consuming a certain amount of urea in it. And I looked up, looked up a little more about milk and I found something. It is contaminated with blood. It is contaminated with pus, hormones and antibiotics which the cattle are given. Now this was something I said very difficult to digest. Every cup of milk officially allows you a certain quantity of blood, certain quantity of pus, antibiotics and the hormones done through. You are allowed. Why? Because in a dairy farm, it is impossible for you, for the animal, not to bleed at the udders from where the milk is being taken out. It, because the process is done by machines and is done repeatedly. So you have to have blood drops getting into your milk of other species. The other thing is because this phenomena is so common in the dairy farm, the animal, the cattle is fed with a lot of antibiotics to prevent infection of the other. And those are the same antibiotics which we tell pregnant women not to consume because it's going to be harmful, lactating women and pregnant women not to consume because it's going to be harmful to their babies. And this is precisely the same milk that we are giving to infants, to children, and we are consuming ourselves. Okay? Then, I showed a very little small clipping. Next. Okay, one sec. Can we go back to that slide? Uh, the ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, over seven years, 50,000 samples of milk all over the country have dis discovered 5.7 milligrams per kg of HCH. HCH is an insecticide which is used for malarial control. It is called hexachlorohexane. 0 0.01 is the limit and we are consuming 5.7. So you are giving pesticides also. These are ICMR figures, right? Next. Okay, small film on dairy. Just have a look at it. It's a four minute, three and a half minute clipping. Just click. No, you have to go back. Go back. Uh, click it with the cursor. Yes, yes, yes.
Right. This is so far as the reality of the day. Fortunately, I was not consuming non-vegetarian food. But for those who consume non-vegetarian food, there is a lot other things that dairy products mean. Chicken, fish and many more things. And the, more or less the same thing is can be extrapolated there and a lot of more facts are there which I will not go into details of those. This film This film is taken from an American dairy farm, but the facts are not very different in India too. Whether it is a commercial dairy farm or even it's our Dudwala Bhaiya, okay? It's, it's not very different because they also have to undergo the same procedure if they want to produce sufficient milk themselves. Yes. So the first thing that I did was I started replacing milk and milk products with plant milks. Yes, we can have plant milks, you can have nut milks, you can have coconut milk, you can have almond milk, you can have cashew milk, peanut milk and soy milk. Soy milk most easily available. It's not too good in taste. I don't like it so much but I'm got used to it. But the rest of the nut milks can be an extremely tasty option. So this is what the first thing I did. And from the same milks, you can also make curd, you can also make buttermilk, which is equally good. Next. So what happens with dairy products? A lot of my patients, they've seen the program. Oh, we like your logic, this is wonderful. But I don't want to leave my chicken and I don't want to leave my meat. So what happens when we take dairy and sugar? Dairy and sugar, when you consume, produce opium-like substances, morphine-like substances, when they get digested. When the animal protein gets digested, they are broken down into small fractions. And these fractions exactly resemble morphine. They are called casomorphines. And therefore, they have a soothing effect. Sugar also produces a substance very similar to morphine. And this morphine, as we know, opium, uh, opium used to be given, opium used to be given to small babies when they used to cry a lot just to have a soothing effect. So sugar also has that kind of an effect, refined sugar I'm talking, the table sugar that we eat. Same thing with dairy and therefore what happens is you need, it gives you a high, it gives you a soothing feeling and therefore you need to have it after every few days. The moment you have it, you put on weight, your metabolism drops and you need another high. So this cycle keeps on going. Next. Now, I, I told you right in the first phase, I was taking sugar substitutes, sugar free, huh? equal, Splenda, all these sugar substitutes where they are said zero calories and they will help opacity. But if you see this graph, from 1960 to 2010, the percentage of population that is consuming artificial sweeteners has increased from 3.3% to 15.1%, practically five times increase. At the same time, you will find this red line is the number of pop percentage of population who have become obese. So sugar substitutes, they induce obesity. This is a very known fact. The other thing that sugar substitutes do is because the sugar substitutes, even in very small quantities, are acidic when they get into your blood. Moment they get into your blood, there is an acidic environment that is created. And to neutralize this acidic environment, the bone calcium is released into your blood. So what happens in the long run is depletion of the calcium from your bone. Osteoporosis is the most dreaded illness again that's coming up. So the sugar substitutes, I realize, are doing two harm to me. 
One, it's not letting my weight go down below, uh, below a certain point. And two, reducing my bone calcium. Next. What about stevia? Come on. Stevia. Stevia, yes. Stevia is an herbal plant uh, sweetener. There is a little different, yes. There is a little difference with the plant sugar. But what is going to ultimately happen? Any of these refined sweeteners, they are not going to tackle your sweet craving. That need for little sweet taste is, is the real problem. Because that sweetness is going to drive you to make other things sweet to get that level of sweetness. For example, dal, if you take without jaggery or without sugar, it was horrible for me to taste initially. But then slowly only I could just start finding the sweetness in that dal. So if you want to appreciate the stars, you will have to cut out all the lights. That's very important. And I found these are refined products in general. All the refined products increase your caloric intake and therefore produce a very sharp increase in your sugar levels and therefore obesity also because you tend to eat more. All refined products including the rice that we eat, refined rice, it never gives you a sense of satiety. It never gives you a sense of satisfaction. So you will need to have three helpings instead of one to get that sense of fulfillment when you take refined food. So the change that I made, next. I started eating whole foods. The first change I made in the phase two, the second phase, I stopped all dairy products and I started replacing them with whole plant products. The next thing I did was I started consuming all whole foods. The first thing I started making a change was my rice because that's probably the only refined product that we Gujaratis consume in the maximum, right? The other uh, product that we consume is mando, right? Biscuits that we eat, the rotis that we, have, we are served in the restaurants. They all have this refined wheat flour. So I cut down my rice and I started replacing the rice with whole rice. And I started using natural sweeteners like dates, raisins, grapes. And the third most important shift that I made, which I found initially when somebody suggested this to me, you have to go zero oil in your cooking. Now is it possible to cook without oil? It almost seemed impossible to me. I said, I have no problem not eating oil, but it's going to be my wife's problem making a zero oil food. But she could do it. It's not at all difficult. The taste is also amazing. So from 2010, what I eat is a practically zero oil, no oil usage. So that's the next refined food. Refined, double refined groundnut oil refined cottonseed oil, all these refined oils are also having the same effect as we eat any kind of refined food. And yes, the last thing, I started cooking. So in this fight, in this battle with this disease, I learned a lot, including cooking. And my wife was relieved, this guy can manage himself now. I'm off. The other thing that happened is people around me also started eating this kind of food. So their health also got benefited. Paisa was so like dumb. Yes. Excuse me. You said ah. natural sweetness. Yes. About fruits then? Yes, yes, fruits, yes. But uh, like I said, grapes. Ah. But others? Yes, other fruits also can be used as natural sweetness. We'll talk about it a little later. Because I have uh, separated out fruits a bit. Next. Why whole food? It gives you a sense of satiety. So the amount of helpings that you need to feel satisfied and also to get the calories that you need for the day, the nutrition is reduced. Very important second thing is when you eat whole food, 
the whole food has a lot of fiber in it, natural fiber. This natural fiber prevents a sharp increase in your blood sugar. So you can eat rice safely, provided it is whole rice. This is protective, fiber is protective against many, many other illnesses, including colonic cancers. This is a proven fact. Next. So three things, plant food, whole food, no sugar or sugar substitute and zero oil food is what I started doing since the last two years. Can we go next? And there you can see, this is from in the last two years, December 2010 to last February 2012. 6.6 .6 was the time where I had started my drug. At this point, this reading that you get is after I managed to skip my drug. So even after I stopped my drug, my mean blood sugar was constant. It didn't get worsened. It goes down further. It maintains at that level. In between, this is the time where we couldn't manage to do this kind of food. There was a lot of repairing and stuff going on in the house, so we had to eat outside. Now, in such a situation, mind you, this is December 2011. From I trust technology. It fails just at the time when you need it the most. This is my and Dr. Hardik, my colleagues' repeated experience. This always happens with us. No? <laughs> what happened to the LCD is getting cold, huh? And then it will start again. Okay, so this is 2011, almost six years after the onset of disease, instead of the sugar levels going high, what I am seeing is they are coming back. In February 2012, it comes down to 6.2. Now, had I not been doing this, in a stressful situation like in December 2012 where we had to eat outside, your blood sugar levels would be going somewhere, your mean blood sugar would be at least around 8 or more. And mind you, this is without taking any drugs. Next. 
this is a complete chart of my weight. No, sorry, mean sugars from this is a complete mean sugar chart, right from what records I have got in 2006 till last I had. No, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Till 12. You can see that the towers are becoming smaller. I'm still continuing to refine things, refine things in the sense getting better with the diet. Next. Right, go, go back, go back. This is my weight. If you start noticing, look at the weight here, here, and look at the weight here. There is one more tall tower of 92 before I started. Today, after 40 years, first time ever in my life, my weight has touched ideal weight, what I am supposed to be. That has happened only after 2010. Prior to that, the 85 mark, I wouldn't go beyond 85 mark. Today, I oscillate between 82 and 80. with good blood sugar. So the blood, the weight loss is not because of your diabetes, sugar going high. Otherwise, you could be just happy with that. Huh? Sugar level going down, uh, weight going down, but your sugar levels climbing. Next. The last and the most important and the most difficult thing was peer pressure. You are in a group and it's extremely difficult where you see, look guys, I don't eat milk, I don't take milk, I don't take XYZ, but I take plant milk. Nobody is going to provide you with soya milk in a marriage party. Hmm? So I had to tackle this and I had a very tough time doing this. Because saying no to people and the first person to say no to was my mom. You know moms, even if you are at 60 year old, Maru Dikro, finish and you have got all the Sweets right there in front of you. You have to eat them. If you don't eat them, over. Oh. Now I have had very difficult time dealing with this. Because I didn't want to hurt people. And I didn't want to hurt myself either. So here at this point in time, I started using a lot of reprogramming. Because there is a lot of reconditioning that happens. I fear that if I say no, sab ke chale jayenge. If I attend a party, which is a very professional party and nothing to do with my close relatives, if you don't network, your business is going to go down. These are common fears that all of us have. So you have to follow the group. This was my thought pattern. But I went through this reprogramming structure, reprogramming your thought pattern and your condition ideas. There are many, many techniques that you can do. I went through these NFTs, EFTs and NLP. EFT is called Emotional Freedom Technique and uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming. There are many other techniques which you can, they are not very difficult, they are pretty easy. But I could reorganize this whole thought pattern. And after I did this, for the first time when I went to a wedding party, I said, I am not taking the plate. And I didn't take the plate. People said what they had to say, but what happened was they did appreciate what I was doing and they still connect with me. Some few people, they stop inviting me for parties and I'm happy not to go for those parties. But what interestingly happened, I feared that I would be left out of the group, but I started getting connected with a lot of new people who are following this kind of lifestyle. So I have come to this conclusion that you can never ever be left out. Whether you need the group or you don't need the group, the group needs you. If not this group, the other group. So I manage this also. And now I am pretty comfortable saying no, it's okay with me and still people don't get offended. In fact, they started getting aligning to your food patterns. If you give in, then they said, okay, he's okay with it, we can serve him tea. Now when I go to people's house, people know that this fellow doesn't take tea. Saru, he also said, you don't want to make ginger, because you don't want to make ginger. So what do you want? 
So oh, well, they are happy, I am happy, my health is done, they are also happy that I am coming to their house. The only thing that remained was people who had true affection, they remained connected to you. Next. So, with this space too, what I could achieve? First thing is I could eat as much as I could wanted to eat. I didn't count and I still don't count what I eat. That's the biggest relief. I have known people who would sit with a weighing scale, at least how much of diabetes go my obesity is gone beyond a point. No strict time schedules I had to follow. That was the biggest relief. I could come back at 10 o'clock, have my food and yet don't worry that the sugars are going to go too bad. I could replace almost every single dairy product with whole plant-based products, including mayonnaise, including cheese, including butter, including buttermilk. Yes, I make mayonnaise out of cashew. And it's as amazing as the mayonnaise that you eat with dairy. So I don't miss things. Yes, and the battle continues. So what I have managed in the last seven years, as you can see, I don't want to say there's a cure, nor am I ever going to make that kind of a claim. It would be very unscientific for me to do that. What I am trying to say is if you can manage with your lifestyle modification to that point, you can trace back the disease in its natural course, which you can see from 7.1 to then down to 6.2 after 11, after 7 long years. Next. Well, this is a disclaimer that I would like to certainly say. I'm not against taking medications. Medications have their role, but what I am trying to say is don't outsource your health to the pills. This is the first thing. You make your personal effort. Second thing, I also appeal to a lot of my colleagues, friends, doctor friends who are here. There is we need to make sufficient effort in helping people modify their lifestyles. This becomes difficult for anyone to follow for a while because the whole mainstream group is not doing this. Imagine if at least one third of the population starts doing this, then it's very easy for you to do. In a place like Oroville in South India, you have a whole community that follows this kind of a diet. And all the foods in the store are available. So when you just go in, it's there. You don't have to make too many plans for it. Do not alter anybody who is taking the medication. Please do not alter after listening to this talk or stop this medication. And I'm not claiming for a cure that I already said. Yeah. Lastly, I, I would like to thank a lot of people who have been a team in, in this whole journey, in this whole battle. First is Sharam, Sanctuary for Health and Reconnection to Animal and Nature. Dr. Nandita Shah, she has been my teacher, she is a homeopath, but she is the one who has guided me through this uh, new lifestyle and Dr. Rupa Shah who works with her. This is the website, if those who are interested can look it up. Next. Well, this is where I am there and most important people my wife, whom I will thank, Kirti, can you come here and share a few words of your difficult journey and Gaurabhai for having arranged this, Supriya Ben is here, Gaurabhai for having arranged this talk and for being a very strong support in many, many things that I have done. You can put all the tough questions to her because she is the one who managed everything. I only did the theory part. Where to start with? Seven years ago, yeah. <laughs> That's where the journey started. Uh, uh, very different from the usual uh, Gujarati cooking. I used to always use less of ghee and oil in my food. But I was, uh, I should say that I was born and brought up on milk. So milk and milk products, to eliminate them from your food, daily food, 
was the difficult, the most difficult task for me. And uh, as he said, and uh, he has rightly named this battle. He has actually battled diabetes. Every time he would go for his test, I was like, oh God, now there is going to be some other change. So, <laughs> and uh, one by one, you know, he went on deleting things from our regular menu that it became so difficult for me at times to think something new. Like everybody wants something new. So you cannot go on repeating the same and same recipes. But slowly we made a change and it was quite difficult but uh, simple also. Since uh, now slowly we have gone to a level where we appreciate more the uncooked food. How easy is it? Yeah, so you don't need to cook also. But um, uh, frankly saying, um, making this shift was um, difficult, but at the same time, uh, I also could improve my health along with this. And uh, uh, slowly you start to realize what your body needs. I used to survive on ice creams, milk, Anywhere I go, and if I don't get milk at a particular time, I'll go mad. And I used to have a lot of acidity. But, and uh, usually doctors say that when you have acidity, please have cold milk. Right? But I realized that after leaving milk, I hardly had acidity. I don't know what, what are the facts, but this is my personal experience. And um, you feel fresh all the time fresh, light, rejuvenated and uh, somebody behind there was saying that I should be telling them how to cook this. Yeah, it is possible, not now, but it is possible we can have such a session where uh, it can be conveyed that how to cook without oil and using any milk or milk products. So that's all I can share with you all. If anybody wants to ask anything, I can uh, satisfy them best of them. From now we can take questions. You had something fruit. with fruit? fruit? Yes, you can have fruits. But the thing sweet is, fruit. Sweet fruit, yes, including a mango. Mango or yes. like at Brigham. Yes. You can eat fruit, but I would caution you against two fruits, uh, especially if your sugar levels are high. One is watermelon and two is pineapple. Yeah. Completely stop. Yes, two things. A mango will not be that bad because it has a lot of fiber in it. Whereas the remaining two don't have a fiber, so your blood sugar just shoots. So including a mango. And also don't peel the fruits. Because peeling the fruits. What about chiku? Yes, chiku also, I would say, if your sugars are high, restrict, avoid. There are lots of insecticides on the fruit. Correct, I know. The last option that I wanted to add was organic. But it's very tough to get organic stuff. We are just beginning to know. I have been able to make a small change towards organic, but not everything. So I have been put it up here. Maybe after two more years. Honey. Best is avoid it. Animal no, product. Honey. honey, exactly. Honey, animal product, avoid it. Yes, but it has a lot of animal part, body parts in it. So best is to avoid it. Organic. Even organic. Even organic. Where to get nut milks other than soya? Nut milks you can make. It takes 10 minutes to make. Soak the nut, whatever you want, overnight without peeling. Next morning, put it into the grinder, blend it, add some water as thick as you want to make it. Done. Yes, Roma. Uh, Roma, Roma, Roma. Uh, very intermittently, not very constantly. So I don't, I have purposely kept that part out because I, in my case at least, I have not seen the influence of the homeopathic drug on the blood sugar. Yes. Also, exercise at a yes, sorry, I forgot to tell you exercise. My exercise regime has been fairly disciplined. Dr. Anil Bhai is my morning walker colleague. So, we go for walks in the morning. But the problem with exercise, after a while, one particular exercise you get bored. So, change the exercise. Go to the gym, go to swim, go to cycle. Garobai's ABC is there. Ahmedabad bicycle. In or club. You can go bicycling. So keep changing exercise, but do an exercise. Very important.
exercise has been of constant change that I have done since always. We have very strong families. Mother side, father side, both. Oh uh, yes, for you you can. Since you are not a diabetic, you can have olive oil. For those who are diabetics and their sugars are well controlled, if at all you need oil, a little bit of what is called cold press oil, these are olive oil or sesame oil, which is cold press, you can have. Little bit. Oh, sorry. We have given a small uh, feedback form, if you can just fill it up and give it back. Thank you so much.